summer 2014, the outbreak becomes an epidemic, spreading across Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria. The small community of virus hunters around the world watches with growing alarm. There are roughly 100,000 international flights every day. A deadly virus can spread from place to place, country to country, long before anyone is aware of what is happening. And the deadly mathematics of infection means the further it travels, the greater the risk to the entire human race. Left unchecked, infections grow exponentially over time. Even if the percentage of the infections is low, say 1%, eventually, the amount added grows larger over each unit of time, doubling and doubling at an ever faster rate. At a certain point, the virus can't be contained. But there are thousands of potentially lethal viruses circulating in the world. How can we know which small outbreak will lead to a pandemic? Professor Alessandro Vespignani of Boston's Northeastern University is an expert on complex systems. He's one of the pioneers of big data. Alex has built a revolutionary program that tracks and predicts the movements of all 7 billion people on Earth. The database culls information from the internet, public health records, demographic data, airline records, and social media. Now we get new data streams that were, you know, not uh, even conceivable a few years ago. You can get mobile phone traces that can be used as a proxy for human mobility. Alex cross-references this with all known information about the behavior of deadly viruses. The result is like a weather forecast for pandemics. But unlike the weather, epidemics can respond to human intervention. We can do very little against the hurricane that is moving on a certain trajectory, but we can do a lot toward diseases. We can do travel restrictions. We can have isolations of infected individuals. We can distribute pharmaceutical interventions. All things that are going to change the course of an epidemic. This pioneering technology is not built for rapid response. But Alex gets daily calls from global health services wondering how bad this outbreak will get. So for the first time, he runs simulations of an epidemic as it's happening. And he comes up with disturbing results. Here we have generated a kind of worst case scenario. We are using the computational platform to look at a scenario in which the containment intervention on the ground are not working. We start with the region, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, Martin Red, because of the number of cases that are growing initially in August and September. But then you will see more and more yellow lines that signal infected carriers traveling across the world. People might try to move away from the epidemic, but actually they are exporting more quickly the epidemic to other places. The numbers are clear. Ebola infections are beginning to climb exponentially. They were seeing a doubling in the number of new patients every three weeks. And that's when they put out the estimation that if left unchecked, the virus would infect by January 1st about a million people. John Dye's lab at USAMRA discovers the most effective Ebola drugs blend several antibodies. But how many? Which combination of the 150 antibodies researchers have isolated will work best? What if the most effective combination is one from Tokyo and one from San Diego? and one from Lyon, and we would never know that until they were all in the same room. And so we founded the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Immunotherapeutic Consortium, the VIC, V-I-C. So I'm the director. What Erica has been amazingly able to do is to basically galvanize the Ebola field. 
She has developed a consortium where all laboratories from all over the world for free are welcome to ship their antibodies to her, where in her laboratory they blind them, so nobody knows what antibody is what, and then they're shipped out to field of virus researchers like me across the country to test with the idea being that we will eventually identify the best antibodies to put into treatments. So it's an amazing novel concept uh, that could be used for any virus or bacteria in the future. And we're starting to find where antibodies attack the virus, and which combinations we put together, and which antibodies are those needles in a haystack that we want to find and put together to make a really potent treatment. Ian Crozier is an early beneficiary of experimental therapies. And after 40 days locked in this room, he miraculously pulls through. Given the course of my illness, I would have been dead in a week. So I'm extremely grateful to the WHO and to the State Department and to Emory, of course. But I'm also haunted by the fact that there wasn't a similar access in many of my patients and some of my colleagues and some of my friends. <laughs>